Um, Fit32, I can't give you the page number because I've got this volume because I left the one volume concise edition at home again. Um, around line uh, 2231 or so. Where I want to begin, uh, or where I want to start begins, there were many such antique reaches, excuse me, antique riches in that earth hall. For in ancient days an unknown man had thought to hide them carefully there, etc. Dan, did everybody get the email about not having the exam today? Just want to make sure because I was kind of surprised I didn't, there weren't, weren't any responses. Usually, you know, there's people falling over themselves wanting to thank me and stuff. Um, <laughs> or you can wait and, you know, till next week. Um, okay, so 2231 B. There were many such antique riches in that earth hall, for in ancient days an unknown man had thought to hide them carefully there. The rich legacy of a noble race, precious treasures. Notice, the legacy of the race, what is left, what is surviving of the race, is just material goods. Okay? In earlier times, death had seized them all, and he who still survived, alone from that nation's army, lingered there. A mournful sentry. Okay? The poet says that this person, this what's traditionally called the last survivor, is a sentry. That means someone who is standing guard, watching, looking, protecting. Expected the same, that he might enjoy those ancient treasures for just a little while. That is, the sentry, the person who puts the treasures in the ground, we're told, is expecting the same as the race of people who have died. How long is he going to enjoy them? Just a little while. Okay. So what good does material wealth bring you? Not a lot. Remember the passage from the wanderer? Here, life is fleeting. Here, friend is fleeting. Here, wealth is fleeting. Here, man is fleeting. Here, woman is fleeting. All the days of this life, we're told, are transitory. That's from the wanderer. Okay. A wading barrow stood in an open field near the ocean waves, new on the cape, safe with crafty narrow entrances. He bore within the noble wealth, the plated gold, that guardian of rings, a share worthy of a hoard, and spoke few words. Okay? So he finds on a cliff, or on a um, high place overlooking the ocean, an open cave. Here it's termed a barrow. Okay. And it's near the ocean waves, it's new on the Cape, that is, it's newly constructed, and it has crafty narrow entrances. Kind of interesting, because obviously this is the same barrow that Beowulf visits when he fights the dragon, but then after Beowulf is killed, what is done with the remains of his body? It's also put in a similar barrow. Beowulf commands, have a big barrow built, that will be called, years thereafter, Beowulf's Barrow. And he says, put me in it. But he doesn't say put all the treasure in it. Beowulf says, I want all this treasure. We're going to find out later on. I want all this treasure for my people. And yet his people don't use the treasure. They put it all in the ground. You can just set it right there. Thanks. <clears throat> just like this guy does. And so he then speaks these few words. Hold now, O thou earth. For heroes cannot the wealth of men. You know, notice that. He's telling the earth, hold this wealth of men. Why? Heroes cannot. What happens to heroes? They die. The wealth outlasts them. The gold outlasts them. The silver, the treasure. So he puts it into the care of something that can hold it for much longer. Lo, from you long ago, those good ones first obtained it. The wealth first came out of the earth when it came out as raw gold, raw silver, etc. And now it's going back into the earth. 
kind of like a from dust to dust. Only here it's from gold to gold, from earth back to earth. Death and war and awful deadly harm have swept away all of my people who have passed from life and left the joyful hall. So this guy's all alone. He said, death took everybody else. Again, like I said last week, he sounds an awful lot like the wanderer, to me at least. Now have I none to bear the sword or burnish the bright cup, the precious vessel. All that host has fled. Again, it's reminiscent of the Ubisunt motif in The Wanderer. Now must the hardened helm of hammered gold be stripped of all its trim. The steward sleep who should have tended to this battle mask. There's nobody to keep everything polished and shiny. So too this warrior's coat, which waited once the bite of iron over the crack of boards, molders like its owner. The coat of mail, not made out of gold, okay? gold which doesn't rust, but the coat of, <clears throat> coat of mail, which is made out of steel, does rust. And so it molders, it becomes decrepit, just as its owner has become decrepit. The coat of mail cannot travel widely with the war chief beside the heroes. Harp joy have I none. Remember what draws Grindel? It's the sound of the harp and the voice of the shope. This guy's saying, I don't have any harp joy. There is no music, so to speak, in his life. There is no joy in his life. No happy song. Nor does the well-schooled hawk soar high throughout the hall. Nor the swift horse stamp in the courtyards. Why? There are no hawks. There are no swift horses. This guy is all alone. Again, it's very reminiscent of that last few lines of The Wanderer when The Wanderer says, here beside this fallen wall. And that's all that seemingly is left of the meat hall. Savage butchery has sent forth many of the race of men. Savage butchery. So grieving, he mourned his sorrow alone after all. Unhappy sped both days and nights, until the flood of death broke upon his heart. And in the very next line, an old beast of the dawn found that shining hoard standing open. And what does a dragon do? Dragon does what dragons do in all medieval literature. Goes in, walks you know, several times around the hoard, kind of like a dog when it gets ready to lay down at night, plops down, the hoard is its, and the dragon goes asleep. And the dragon stays asleep. That's why, you know, the, the thing I mentioned last week, the motto of Hogwarts, never rouse a sleeping dragon. Dragons are fine as long as they're asleep. How do you rouse a dragon? Steal something from it. It's exactly it. Steal something from the dragon and the dragon goes out. Now, it's going to be kind of interesting when we finally get up to Beowulf and Beowulf goes off to fight the dragon. After Beowulf is killed, we're going to find out something about the dragon before Beowulf was killed. When Beowulf went off to the dragon, he yells into the barrel. Why? What has the dragon already done? Gone back to sleep. The dragon has already gone back to sleep. That is, the dragon has its cup stolen by this thief, comes out, torches the whole countryside, figures it's good, goes back inside, goes back to sleep. Seemingly for another 300 years. Okay? Because Wheelof is going to tell us after Beowulf's death what Wheelof thinks about what Beowulf did in fighting the dragon. Okay? So for 300 years, Line 2278, the dragon holds the mound and holds the treasure until one man made him boil with fury. The man who bore to his liege lord the plated cup begged for peace from his lord. Then the hoard was looted, the hoard of rings. Okay, it doesn't mean looted like you and, well, I won't say you. It doesn't mean looted like I would mean loot. I mean, if, if I was looting the hoard, I wouldn't take one cup. 
I mean, I'd get everything my hands could get their, my greedy arms around and then leave. Looted here means he takes one thing. Okay? When the dragon stirred, strife was renewed. He slithered along the stones, stark hearted. He found his enemy's footprint. He had stepped too far in his stealthy skill, etc. Thus can an undoomed man easily survive rack <clears throat> and ruin. Just notice, the guy who steals the cup, he doesn't get killed when the dragon comes out and torches everything. Why? He's undoomed. In other words, weird is on his side. If he holds to the ruler's grace and protection. Okay? The horde guardian searched along, that's, that's the dragon. The horde guardian searched along the ground, greeted to find the man who had sorely harmed him while he slept. And we're told what? He kept circling around his cave all around the outside. But no one was there in that wilderness to welcome his warfare and the business of battle. So he returned to his barrow. He sought his treasure. He discovered that someone had disturbed his gold, his great wealth. He waits until the evening comes, and then he goes out. And what does he do? He probably acts like this. Let's assume for a moment <clears throat> that the land of the gates is something like this. Okay? Here's the barrow. The dragon comes out. The dragon doesn't just psh, fly over here, you know, spew some fire. He probably does this. Because okay? what's he doing, really? He's trying to find the one who stole his cup. He's trying to find the tracks or footprints. And so he makes his way out. And we're told, pay uh, fit 33. Then that strange visitor began to spew flames and burn the bright courts as burning gleams struck horror in men. Skipping a little bit. Um... After he'd done all this, then he hastened to his horde, his dark and hidden hall, before the break of day. He had surrounded the people of that region with fire, flames, and cinders. He took, tr he took shelter in his barrow, his walls in warfare, but that trust failed him. What has the narrator told us there? What's going to happen to the dragon? It's going to die. Why did the narrator tell us this? Because very soon we're going to hear about Beowulf. And the poet's going to say, Beowulf's not going to outlast this battle. He might win it, but he's going to die too. Don't Anglo-Saxons have, have a notion of suspense? Right. He gives away the ending. I mean, we still have almost a thousand lines. Why give it away? Because their idea of suspense is not necessarily the same as ours. All right? Um, go on, 23, 24. To Beowulf the news was quickly brought of that horror that his own home, the best of buildings, had burned in waves of fire, the gift throne of the gates. Okay, now keep in mind, Beowulf is king at this point. So his own home probably means <laughs> his throne room, so to speak. The gift throne of the gates would be his kingly seat. So that's been destroyed. Now, go back for a minute to Herod. What was Grindel never able to do? He was never able to approach the gift throne of the gates. Or, you know, if you take Lewis's translation, you know, salute it or greet it. You know, like, hello, gift throne. It doesn't make a lot of sense. To the good man, that was painful in spirit, greatest of sorrows. That is when Beowulf hears this. The wise one believed he had bitterly offended the ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. Notice what Beowulf's immediate reaction is. What's he thinking? I'm not going to deserve this. Exactly. And it's not just... It's not, why me? It's, what have I done? How have I offended who? The ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. That is, 
What have I done against the old law to offend God? Sounds pretty Christy slash monotheistic at least. His breast within groaned with dark thoughts. That was not his custom. How, how do we know that that's not his custom? He's always been very confident, self-assured. What did we see a thousand lines earlier? Hrothgar said, you know, sorrow is renewed, Asher is dead, woe is me, blah, blah, blah. And what did Beowulf essentially say? Well, what he specifically said was, it's better not to mourn much, it's better to avenge a friend. In other words, put it in modern parlance, suck it up, be a man, do something, don't sit there and whine. Okay, And here... He's full of dark thoughts. What, what's meant by dark thoughts? Is what have I done to deserve this dark thoughts? It can be. What else can dark thoughts be? Where can you go from that idea? What have I done to deserve this? Where can that line of thinking go? Okay, suicidal thoughts. I heard something else. Okay. Reassessing what you I mean, you can take that line and you can just kind of start to dwell on it, right? And get pretty depressed. As was not his custom. That's not what Beowulf normally does. Okay. So we're told, Beowulf 2336, Devised revenge. He bade the men make a wondrous war shield, all covered with iron. Why? Because he knows a traditional shield made of wood going up against a dragon that breathes fire, not going to do a lot of good. All right? And then we're told, the long good nobleman had to endure the end of his... Loaned days. Okay? Life here is a loan, the speaker is telling us. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't go on ad infinitum. This world's life, and so did the worm. I mean, look at that. We've still got 800 lines to go, and the poet has just told us they're both going to die. So much for modern notions of suspense. Though he had held for so long his hoarded wealth. Beowulf held the realm, held the kingship for 50 years, and the dragon held his quote unquote kingship for over 300. Then that Prince of Rings scorned to seek out the far flung flyer, it's hard to say, with his full force of men. Roy really should have translated that line differently. Far-flung flyer, full force of men. You've got five words there beginning with the f sound. That would never occur. That never does occur in Anglo-Saxon verse. Okay? Way too much alliteration going on there. A large army. Notice, he scorns to get a large army to go off and take on the dragon. He did not dread that attack, nor did he worry much about the dragon's warfare, his strength or valor. Why? Because he, Beowulf, had survived many battles, barely escaping alive in the crash of war. After he had cleansed triumphant hero, the Hall of Hrothgar, and had battle crushed Grindel in his kin, that loathsome race. And then the poet goes off onto a digression. Beowulf doesn't want to take a whole army of men to fight the dragon, because Beowulf thinks back to all of the battles he has fought since the time of Grindel. And he's escaped through all of them. So he's thinking, I'm Beowulf. Nothing can harm me. Seemingly, that's what he's thinking. And we're told, second digression to the Frisian raid of Helak. Right? It was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Helak was slain. When the king of the gates, in the chaos of battle, the lord of his people in the land of the Frisians, the son of Frethel, died sword drunk. What is sword drunk? 
It can mean a couple of different things. He died in the heat of battle, drunk with swordplay, or another sword drank of his blood. Okay. Beowulf escaped from there through his own strength. Notice, nothing here about God helping him. Okay. He took a long swim. <clears throat> he had in his arms the battle armor of 30 men when he climbed to the cliffs. So if you put up the map, the geography of Beowulf that we had, uh, that I sent to you, and you have the, you know, the Frisians are over here, and you have the Angles and the Jutes, etc., and the Geats are way over here, the Frisians over here, and here's the Rhine River. It's on the Rhine River that uh, Helak is supposedly buried at. What does that mean, he swam? It means, you know, you take the Rhine to its mouth on the North Sea, and he swam. And he goes, if he swam the whole way, he had to go up over modern-day Denmark, come back around to the island or to where the land of the gates was. It's even a longer swim than he did in the swimming contest with Brecca. And this one he did with 30 suits of armor. Somehow in his arms. Okay. By no means did the Hetware need to exult in that fight. The Hetware are the ones he's fighting against. When they marched on foot to him, bore their linen shields. Few came back from that brave soldier to seek their homes. That is another example, I think I've talked about this before, of Lytotes. Understatement. How few came back to seek their homes? None. Okay, that's how few. Now what does that term mean? Yeah. Understatement. understatement. Exaggerated understatement. Okay. Um, poem we didn't read, but Dream of the Rude has a spot where Christ is deposited in his tomb. And the speaker says he had little troop with him. Well, how many troops did Christ have with him in the grave? Exactly. That's how little it was. Okay. Same kind of thing is working here. The son of Edgethal crossed the vast sea, wretched, solitary, returned to his people, where Hig offered him the hoard and kingdom, rings and royal throne. So, Helak dies on the Rhine, Beowulf swims back, and he's the only one who survives. Now, remember the day when I put up the fourfold Germanic ethic? Duty to one's lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's lord and kin. And the last one, the emphasis or trust or reliance, however you want to put it, in weird. Part and parcel of that in the Germanic mindset is the notion that if your lord dies in battle, you really ought to die with him. Okay? With this one exception. If you can kill everybody. If you can kill everybody, you, and, you know, you got your lord there, and he's dead, and all your troops are around him, and then outside around all of them is all of the enemy, it doesn't mean you have to slit your throat and die. Okay? If, if you can live, and everybody else is dead, then that's okay. That's the only exception, really, and that's the only exception Beowulf has here. Some of us still think there's, you know, there's a problem with Beowulf's character here. Okay, because of the fact that he does survive. He goes home, and notice Helak's wife offers him the horde, kingdom, rings, and royal throne. Now, some people want to say that Hig offers him a little bit more than that. Okay, keep in mind, she's Helak's queen. She is Beowulf's aunt. And some people say, actually, what she's doing is she's offering him herself. That if he becomes king, she becomes his queen. Personally, I think that's people looking for sex where there is no sex. Okay? She did not trust that her son could hold the ancestral seat. Why? Because at this point, Hardred is just a boy. 
He's young. So what does Beowulf do? He doesn't say, yeah, I'll take the throne and take you as my wife. Okay. He doesn't, because that would get into the whole Hamlet problem. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He supports him. He stands behind him, you know, like this, flexes his muscles and says, you come get here, you got to go through me. Okay? He acts big and tough because everybody knows who Beowulf is, right? Everybody's already heard stories about him. Okay? So he just stands behind Hardred, flexes his muscles, and nobody touches him. Apparently for a while at least. But this doesn't last long. Because we're told, line 2379, wretched exiles, the sons of Ultera, sought him out across the seas. They had rebelled against the Shilving's ruler. The best of all the sea kings who dispensed treasure in the Swedish lands, a famous king. Okay, now we have to get a little bit confusing maybe. Because now you really need to understand what is going on. Okay. We had Crevel, who's got four kids, right? Two, three, four. Um, Hathkin, Harabald, Helak, and then she's a no. And then over here, the Swedes, we have Anjanthal, these are Swedes, these are Gates, Anjanthal has Othera and Onala, he's the one who marries Hrothgar's sister, right? who's probably named uh, Irsa. Right? Othera has two sons, Anmund and Eagils. Okay, He's the oldest, he's the youngest. So now we have to back up a little bit. What we're being told here at this part is that these two reject his becoming king. Probably because the text of Beowulf doesn't tell us this, but other Norse and Germanic literature does. Probably because Onola kills his brother to become king. Right? He's next in line, supposedly, after Othera to be king even though they did not strictly have what we call primogenitor. Eldest son becomes next in line. They, there was a council that elected the king. Usually, it was the next in line. I mean, like 99% of the time. Right? So, he elect dies. His son, Hardred, becomes king. And Hardred allows these two to come over for refuge. And keep in mind, he's got Beowulf flexing his muscles, standing behind him. So Hardwood allows them to come over. They do. But Onola's not happy with that. Okay? So he attacks. And when he attacks, Hardwood gets killed. And so does he. When he attacks, he has a man working for him named Weston, a warrior. Okay, this is all going to make sense in a few minutes. Let's put Beowulf kind of back here behind him. Weston comes when these two are over here, when Onla attacks, 
Weston comes. Weston kills Anmund. Right? He takes Anmund's armor. He takes his sword. Weston is then going to have a son later on. That son is named Wheelof. That is the same Wheelof who helps Beowulf fight the dragon. Okay? Everybody kind of clear with me? Well, what happens when Beowulf fights the dragon? Beowulf dies. <coughs> who becomes king? Wheelof becomes king of the gates. He's already dead. He's dead. He dies after a while. So the one who's left king of the Swedes is Aedils. What problem does Aedils have against Wheelof? Wheelof's father killed his brother. Duty to avenge one's kin? So when Beowulf dies, Wheelof becomes king. The whole feud against the Swedes is going to get opened up again. Because the feud actually goes all the way back here. Okay? Because Hathkin, back up even more, we're going to find this out in other stuff we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Hathkin attacks Onyandel. Stupid move on his part. He not only attacks him, he he apparently, we're going to be told, kidnaps his wife and, quote-unquote, takes her gold. Now, you can interpret that any way you want. Okay? But because he does that, um, Anya Thal is obviously not all that happy. Hathkin gets killed. Helak comes to the rescue. Some of Helak's troops kill Anya Thal. Okay, but notice who began the feud. These guys. These guys started it. Okay. Hrethel wasn't involved. Hrethel was dead by this point. This guy's dead by this point, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, it gets kind of convoluted, right? So, that's what is being talked about there, 2379. Wretched exiles, the sons of Otara, sought him out across the seas. They had rebelled against the Shilvings rulers. The Shilvings are the Swedes. The best of all the sea kings who dispensed treasure in the sweetest lands, a famous king. The poet says, Onola is the best of all sea kings. <coughs> is Beowulf not a sea king? Was Hrothgar not a sea king? Did they not have ships? Yes, they did. And yet the poet is saying, this guy is the best of all the kings who went to sea. But he doesn't stop there. That cost him his life. That is, that cost Hardred his life by giving these two refuge. Okay. For his hospitality, he took a mortal hurt with the sword of a stroke, that son of Helak. And the son of Onyanthiao, this one, afterwards went out to seek his home. That is, he comes to the land of the gates, Hardred is killed, and the son of Onyadal, Onala, goes back to the land of the Swedes. But he doesn't, he does something first. He afterwards went out to seek his home. Once Hardred lay dead, and let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the gates. That was a good king. The most important word in that passage. Let. He let Beowulf hold the throne. What does that show? Say that again. He's in control. He is the one in power and authority, not Beowulf. Well, what happened to the strength of 30 men in each hand group? Why doesn't Beowulf just snap his scrawny little neck? He's not old at this point. Oh, he's not. This is before, he's before the 50 year reign. This is when he's, you know, young and brawny. Okay. I mean, 30, maybe 40. We're not exactly sure.
But he's young and he's tough. And we're told, Onla comes, attacks, he kills Beowulf's lord. What is it incumbent upon Beowulf to do? To revenge his lord. And yet, Onla let, and that's exactly the word that appears in the Old English, let, let Beowulf have the throne. The Old English is, he let Beowulf hold the throne. In other words, he could not have let Beowulf hold the throne. And he goes back. So, what problem does this raise? Or does it? It questions Beowulf's integrity. It questions his character. When I first posed this question, sheesh, when was this? Uh, back in about 1995 or so, when I first posed this question on an Anglo-Saxon listserv called ANSAX for scholars of Anglo-Saxon and stuff, and I posited the idea that maybe Beowulf is not all as good and shiny as he's supposed to be. Man, talk about needing a armored male. I mean, the Beowulf lovers, supporters, came out of the woodwork saying essentially, how dare you question Beowulf's honor and character. It's like, you know, look, read the text. I mean, turn, some other folks have come out since then have made pretty much similar arguments. Okay, And let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the gates, dash, that was a good king. Who was a good king? Beowulf or Onla? See, a lot of scholars say that that was a good king refers to Beowulf. There's no way in my reading. It's talking about Onla. Okay? It shouldn't. That's a problem. In later days, he did not forget that prince's fall. He, Beowulf, that prince's, Hardred's. In other words... And this is the argument that is always um, adduced to support Beowulf's character. He just bided his time until the right moment, and he could strike back. When has Beowulf had to bide his time before? In previous battles, at least, that we've seen. Never. He never has to plan and conspire, so to speak. And he befriended Aegil's, this one, to do what? So that he could take the throne away from him. Okay, whatever happened to, you know, loving your kin, duty to kin, he kills him. Okay. It's because of him that he's dead. So he now has a duty to avenge his father's death and his brother's death. Where is that duty to avenge? What's the object of it? On him. But how can he do that? Uh, yes. Primarily that's your sister's son relationship. He doesn't have a sister. But other than that, yeah. I mean, this is supposed to be a very close relationship. And he's got to take on his uncle and kill him. So much for duty to kin. How, how do you do duty to Ken when your Ken is the one who killed your brother? See the problem with the Germanic ethic? It, it's entirely inconsistent. It doesn't work. Okay? It will tear a fabric apart. Uh, excuse me, a society apart. So he befriended Aegils, the wretched exile, across the open sea. He gave support to the son of Otra with warriors and weapons. He wreaked his revenge with cold, sad journeys and took the king's life. Okay? The he there, you're told, is Aegils, not Beowulf. But doesn't Beowulf have a duty? I mean, doesn't Beowulf have a duty to get his hands around Onla's neck himself? Can you argue that Aegil had 
um, greater to, duty. To do it so Beowulf following his duty made it so the angel could. Yeah, you could make that argument, I think. Okay. They both have an equal responsibility, let's say. Aegil's is maybe stronger because the bonds are closer, okay? That, you know, he killed his father and king, and brother would be king, right? But uh, for, for some Beowulf scholars, it's just a, you know, this is a thorny spot. This is a rough spot in our understanding of Beowulf. And so the son of Edgethaod survived every struggle, every terrible onslaught, with brave deeds, until that one day when he had to take his stand against the serpent. So what does he do? He seeks out a dozen men. Or he takes a dozen men to seek out the dragon. He found out by then how the feud arose, the baleful violence. The precious vessel had come to him through the thief's hands. He... The thief was the 13th man among the troop okay, who had brought about the beginning of that strife. And that when it says he took a dozen men, that means Beowulf and 11 others. Okay? And then the thief becomes the 13th man. If you've ever seen the film with Antonio Banderas, The 13th Warrior, which is Michael Crichton's retelling of Beowulf, it's kind of following that language. And so the thief leads them to the barrow, notice, against his will. And we're told, 2409, he went against his will to where he alone knew the earth hall stood, an underground cave near the crashing waves, the surging sea. Inside it was full of gems and metal bands, a monstrous guardian eager for combat kept his gold treasures ancient under the ground. So what does Beowulf do? Beowulf and 12 other men march to this barrow, and then Beowulf sits down on the cape. He's looking, he sits down on the edge of the cliff, kind of looking out over the ocean. He wishes good health to his hearth companions, the gold friend of the gates. Is that a good sign? Good luck, men! <laughs> you know. His heart was grieving, restless and ripe for death. Restless. What? How did Hrothgar end his homily? Remember? He says, no matter what, death takes you. It will take you through fire. It will take you through flood. It will take you through sword or spear or old age or sickness or blindness and you just wither away. And Beowulf's like, not me, man. I'm going out with a bang. Okay? His heart was grieving, restless, ripe for death. The doom was immeasurably near that was coming to meet that old man. Seek his soul's treasure, split asunder his life and body. That is, the doom was coming to do this. The doom was coming to seek his soul's treasure. And his soul is the treasure of the body. Okay? In fact, the chest is even called the treasure hoard of the body. Not for long was the spirit of that noble king enclosed in its flesh. And so Beowulf sits down, he kind of looks out at the ocean, and I don't know, maybe this is a little, uh, he's channeling Matthew Arnold, you know, 900 years before Arnold or so, if you've ever read Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. And he looks out over the ocean and he starts to think of, you know, Oedipus, so to speak. In my youth I survived many storms of battle, times of strife. I remember them all. I was seven years old when the Prince of Treasure's friend to his people took me from my father. Okay? Who is the Prince of Treasure's? Gravel. Okay? Gravel raised him. His grandfather raised him. Beowulf was fostered here. 
Prevel the king held me and kept me, gave me gems and feasts, remembered our kingship, our kinship. I was no more hated to him while he lived than any of his sons. And he mentions them, Herobald and Hathkin, and my own Helak. I've got these two backwards. Herobald's the older, Hathkin's next in line. For the eldest, undeservedly, a deathbed was made by the deeds of a kinsman. After Hathkin, with his hornbow, struck down his own dear lord with an arrow. In other words, Hathkin accidentally killed Haribald. Okay? Kind of interesting. Because this is something that happens in Germanic myth among two of the gods. Okay? And what's interesting here is that this part of each of their names bears a striking resemblance to the names of these gods. Baldur and his brother Huther. Okay? Bald Huth. If you're familiar with Norse mythology at all, or even if all you're familiar with is the film Thor, okay, Loki, the trickster god, tricks Holder into shooting Balder. Only thing is, he's not shooting him with a bow and arrow, because according to the Germanic myth, there's only one way you can kill Balder, and that is striking him with mistletoe. He had fear kissing or something. Okay? <laughs> and that's what happens. Hother pierces him with mistletoe. Balder dies. And that's what brings in Ragnarok. The big final battle between gods, men on one side against the frost giants and dwarves and elves and Orkneas and all the monsters, etc. Okay? So you have this little element of Germanic mythology finding its way here. He accidentally kills him. Father now has a duty, right? Father has a duty to bring vengeance on his son for the death of a son. Well, how do you avenge a son by killing a son? You can't kill your son because you, then you violate the Germanic ethic. He is proverbially screwed, right? So matter if it's an accident. No, not really. <laughs> Can you just banish him or something? Put him in exile? Or take money? But it's still his son. Yeah. But it's still his son. Where does his wealth come from? Daddy. <laughs> well, it's simple in logic, but it could be argued. Yeah, I, okay. It's kind of like when your child messes up and you're taking away their allowance or you make them give it back. I mean, it's, it's your money, but they pay you. Sure. <laughs> okay. Listen to what he tells us what happens. <laughs> Um, one brother to the other with a bloody shaft. That was a fight beyond settling. Beowulf tells us this. In other words, there's no way to settle this crime. There, there's no legal way in Germanic society. A sinful crime shattering the heart. Yet it had to be that a nobleman lost his life unavenged. Unavenged. So it is sad for an old man to, to live to see his young son ride on the gallows. Okay? And you get a long footnote saying, this is probably an epic simile because no one is 100% sure of why the poet does this. Okay? Probably the old man is Hrethel and the young son on the gallows. He's not really have him because he's not hang, hanging from a gallows. Them let him recount a story, a sor sorry song, when his son hangs of comfort only to the ravens. And so what does the old father do? He looks at his son's dwelling, the deserted wine hall, the windswept home, bereft of joy. The riders sleep, heroes in their graves. It sounds like what? Like we're back at that treasure being put in the barrel and all the heroes are dead. Okay? There is no heart music, no laughter in the court, as there had been long before. And so the old man, 2460, takes to his couch and keens a lament, all alone for his lost one. 
So, in other words, just as in this simile I've told you, so the protector of the waiters, Hrethel, bore surging in his breast heartfelt sorrows for Herobald. He could not in any way make amends for the feud with his murderer. But neither could he hate that warrior for his hostile deeds. Nor could he hate his son. Then, with the sorrow which befell him too sorely, he gave up man's joys. He chose God's light. Okay. Yecheas godes lecht is what the Old English says. Doesn't, it, it doesn't even imply that it's any kind of metaphor. Notice, um, Luza gives you a gloss on it, but it means he died. Well, yeah, that is what it means. Okay. He left to his children, his land and strongholds, etc. And then we're told, strife between the Gates and the Swedes. And how did that strife begin? Let's pick up at 2479. My friends and kinsmen got revenge for those feuds and evils, as it is said, although one of them paid for it with his own life, a hard bargain. That battle was fatal for Hathkin, king of the gates. Then I've heard, notice Beowulf is suggesting, I wasn't there. One kinsman avenged the other with the sword's edge when Onyenthal attacked Eelver. Eelver is one of Hathkin's men. Right? In fact, Hathkin, um, we're going to be told, if I remember right, gives his daughter in marriage to Elder. Um, he attacked Elder, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to skip a bit. Line 2490. I have paid in battle for the precious treasures he, okay, that is uh, Helak, gave me, as was granted to me, with a gleaming sword. He gave me land, a joyous home. He goes on and talks about other things that happened in line 2501. Let me back up. 2499. I will wage war while this sword endures, which before and since has served me well, since I slew Day Raven. Day Raven was Helax killer. Okay? Beowulf says, as long as I can hold this sword, I will fight. But he says he slew Dayraven with his bare hands. He finishes his speech, line 2509, and then he starts another speech. Okay, he just kind of keeps going. I have survived many battles in my youth. I will yet seek out an old folk guardian, a feud, and do a glorious deed. If only that evildoer, evildoer will come out to me from his earth hall. Notice, they get to the barrow, they look inside, what do they see? Big old massive dragon sleeping on a mound of treasure. What's the dragon not doing? Anything. It's not doing it. It's sound asleep. And Beowulf says, I will seek out an old folk guardian, a feud. Meaning, I will start a feud and do a glorious deed. Why does he need to do a glorious deed? Because his heart is restless. Beowulf wants to die. And Beowulf is thinking, seems clear to me, Man, what a way to go out, to take on a dragon. Then they could really compare me to Sigmund. Right? Then for the last time, he salutes each of the soldiers, his own dear comrades, and says, you know, I wouldn't carry a sword or bear a helmet if I knew any other way I could grapple with this great beast. He said, you know, I fought Grindel without any weapons. But I expect the heat of battle flames there, steam and venom. Therefore, shield and burning will I have on me. 
I shall not or will not flee a single foot, but for us it shall be at the wall, and at the wall is a metaphor means for at the point or place of battle. It shall be what? As weird decrees, the ruler of every man. Notice he doesn't say as God decrees. This is the one clear place in the poem where Beowulf sounds much more traditionally Germanic pagan. Okay? My mind is firm. I will forego boasting against this flying foe. So what does he command his men to do? Yeah, pretty, pretty much it. You guys go sit over there and watch. Wait on the barrow, protect it in your burnies, to see which of the two of us after the bloody onslaught can better bear his wounds. It is not your way, not proper for any man except me alone. Why Beowulf alone? He wants the glory of it. He wants the glory of it, and? I'm a monster killer. You know, your name's Weeloth. The Grindel Killer? No. It's Wheeloff. Nothing. And you other guys, nothing. In fact, they're not even named. They're so insignificant. So he says, with daring I shall get that gold, or grim death and fatal battle will bear away your lord. He stands up. He trusted his strength. And we're told... He saw then by the wall, he who would survive a great many conflicts, good and manly virtues, stone arches standing. He sees at the barrow what kind of entrance? We're told arches. Did Anglo Saxons build arches? Did Germanic peoples build arches? Who built arches? Romans. Okay. So, how old is this barrel? We're going to find out later on. The treasure was in the ground 700 years before the dragon. And the dragon's been on it for 300. It's been in the ground for 1,000 years. So, the barrel is 1,000 years old. So, if Beowulf, the poem, is said in roughly 500 A.D., then that takes it back to 500 B.C. Uh, Rome wasn't anywhere near Scandinavia in 500 B.C. Okay? What is this an example of? This is an anachronism in, you know, an 8th, 9th, or 10th century Anglo-Saxon poem. Similarly, when Beowulf and Hrothgar's men made their way back from Grindel's Mere when they followed the trail of slime and stuff following Grindel. We were told that they followed a street, a paved street. Romans. Because the Romans were the only people at the time who made paved streets. Germanic people did not have paved roads. Okay. That is telling us you could say that and this are telling us that the action in Beowulf is actually occurring, at least in the poet's mind, in an area that the Romans once held sway in. So is it really Scandinavia or might it be England? Right. And by the way, most barrows that survive that have entrances, they're not arches. They are upright stones with lintel stones on top of them, like you see at Stonehenge, okay? which means they're Celtic or earlier, okay? uh, Neolithic. So Beowulf goes off to fight the dragon. We're told a stream shooting forth from the barrow. Its surge was hot with deadly flames, blah, 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 blah. And what happens? 2550. Enraged, the ruler of the waiter gates let a word burst forth from his breast, shouted starkly. We're not told what word. And what the old English actually says is he was yelbolgen. He bellowed. <coughs> the sound entered and resounded battle clear under the gray stone. 
Hate was stirred up. The Horde Warden, that's the dragon, recognized the voice of a man. That's kind of interesting, because what does that tell us about the dragon? It's intelligent. It's intelligent. The dragon is sentient. It knows the difference between the voice of a man and the voice of, I don't know, little Peter Cottontail or something. Okay. What does Beowulf yell? You dirty, rotten son of a no... We don't know. But whatever it is, the dragon recognizes. This is one of the things that made Ray Tripp, the scholar I referred to last week, say that the dragon was actually that last survivor who lay down on the horde and woke up the next morning a dragon. Or 300 years later, a dragon. And so what happens? The dragon comes out. Beowulf draws his sword, line 2562. Its edges undulled, an ancient heirloom. Each of the two hostile ones was horrified by the other. The word used that translates as hostile ones is this word. Aglaka. Okay? Which is kind of interesting, kind of an interesting word in, in Beowulf. Because when it's first used, it refers to Grindel. And it used to be translated almost all the time as monster. And then it gets used again to describe Grendel's mother. And then it's used also to describe the dragon, which are, you know, three pretty clear monsters. But here it's used to describe Beowulf and the dragon. So does that mean Beowulf is also a monster? Or do you do like what Leusa does here and you come up with another translation? Oh, it's not only monster, it is, as some editors will give as glosses, fierce combatant, fearsome warrior, hostile one, semicolon, monster. And they only give monster for what we kind of traditionally term to be monsters. But isn't Beowulf in some sense also monstrous? I mean, he's got the strength of 30 men in each hand. I don't know about you, but that ain't normal. Okay. And we're told he stands stout-hearted behind his steep shield. The dragon comes. But we're told, 2575, there on that day for the first time he faced the outcome and weird did not grant victory in battle. Again, it's weird. Why not God? Every other battle we have that Beowulf is involved in, we're told God granted him victory in battle. Yes? But didn't they all say a lot earlier that yes, Weird was powerful and all that, but a man could determine his own team and stuff? He says um, Weird does not fate the undoomed man. Okay? And he says you can, you can work with Weird. In other words, you can kind of turn Weird your way. Okay? But what have we already been told about Beowulf in this section? He's ready to die. Yep. He's ready to die. Why is he doing it? Going to it, you know, victorious. You know, let's die. Let's, you know, let's do it. He, well, but we're told even when he goes up and he faces the dragon, as you said, doom was near. He realizes this is it. This is my chance to go out, so to speak. All right? So he raises his hand and he strikes the dragon with his ancient sword so that the edge failed bright against the bony scales. It bit less strongly than the king of that nation needed it to do. Notice what he, what he tries to do. Where does he try to hit the dragon? On the head. Okay. But the dragon is more savage after that because he's angry. And then we're told the gold friend of the gates did not boast of his glorious victories. His bare sword failed at need. Like hunting, Unfair's sword failed at need. As it should never have done that ancient good iron. It was no easy journey for the famous son of Edgethow to agree to give up his ground in that place. What does it mean to give up his ground? What's he doing? He's backing up. The dragon is forcing him back. Beowulf said, 
I won't give up an inch. And he was forced to find a place of rest elsewhere, just as every one of us must give up these lone days. Well, that's a whole beautiful euphemism for he had to die. He was forced against his will to find a place of rest elsewhere. Against his will, he was forced to die. Just as every one of us must give up these loaned days. Are you familiar with um, Emily Dickinson's I Could Not Stop for Death? Okay. Because I could not stop for death, what did death do? Death stopped for me. Okay. That's exactly what happens with Beowulf here. So they take a little breather. And then they go at it again. All right. And we're told, Beowulf's comrades, line 2596, hand chosen, sons of noblemen, did not take their stand in a troop around him with warlike valor. They fled to the woods and saved their lives. The spirit rose up in sorrow in the heart of one of them. Nothing can overdo overrule kinship at all in one who thinks well. Okay. Notice by saying they did not take their stand in a troop around Beowulf, what is the poet kind of implying? They should have. Okay. If we had read, if we'd been able to read the Battle of Malden, the Battle of Malden has been described as containing the greatest expression of the Germanic heroic spirit because of the lines that come at the end Spoken by, hold on a second, um, spoken by Birtnoth. Just give me the poem. You have better yet. Um, from these lines, from the towards the end of the poem, he shall fahadra her to the kinder, mod shall the mara the urimayan litleth. Okay, spirit. Now let me use my translation because I don't like this one. Spirit or heart shall be harder. Heart the keener. Um. Mind shall be more as our strength lessens. And that's spoken by this grizzled old warrior over the dead body of his lord. And what he's saying there is, as our troops get fewer and fewer and fewer as we fight these Danes, these Vikings, those of us who are still alive have got to be firmer in our resolve. He knows he's going to die. He knows we are going to die, but we have got to be even firmer in our resolve and in our courage and in our spirit. As you get taken out and you get taken out and you get taken out. Okay. That's the mentality. Because what they do there in the Battle of Malden is they surround their dead Lord. Kind of back to the body, swords out. And as they get whittled down one by one, bodies just get piled higher and higher. That's what Beowulf's men should have done. But what do they do? Pew. They bug out. They flee. Except for one, Wilof, Weston's son, okay? A worthy shield warrior, a prince of the Shilvings, that's these guys, okay? We're told a kinsman of Alphera. We don't have a flying clue who Alphera is. N nobody knows. It's the only reference to Alphera, period. Alphera means elf army. Now that'd be pretty cool. Have an <laughs> elf army, you know, a bunch of Legoluses come in, you know, okay? <laughs> But that's our only reference to him. And we're told he sees Beowulf, he sees him suffering under the heat, and he recalls the honors he had received from him. The wealthy homestead of the Waymundings, that's an honor 
Wheelof received. Beowulf conferred on him the ancestral home of the Waymundings. Why? This is Beowulf and Wheelof's connection. They're both of the tribe of the Waymundings. Okay? And we're told. He grabs his shield. Notice it's a pale linden shield made from the linden tree. And he grabs his sword. And then the poet tells us the history of the sword. It was known among men as the heirloom of Anmund, son of Ultra. That friendless exile was slain in battle with the edge of a sword by Weston, who brought to his kinsmen the burnished helmet, the ring birney, the old giant work sword. So when Weston killed Anmund, he then took all of Anmund's armor, okay, his uh, coat of mail, shirt of mail, his sword, and he handed them to Onola and said, These belong to you. And Onola said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. They're yours. So now they become Westons. He dies, and he passes them on to Wheelof. And it's almost like we're right back there at the story Beowulf told of Frey Rowu and uh, Ingild. What's going to happen when they get married? They're going to go off and live in the land of the Heathobards, and some young stud, Dane, is going to be strutting around in some old Heathobardish armor, some old heather bard is going to tell to the son of the man whose armor it belonged to, it's your daddy's armor. Get him. And strife will be renewed. Right? Notice how strife is often renewed by the passing on of stuff. Good old solid material stuff. So we're told, Onola gave it to him. He had never spoke of a feud, though he had slain his brother's son. Okay. Uh, he kept that gear for many years. He gave it to his son. And then Wheelof speaks to the men. I remember the time that we took mead together. This is line 2632. 33, excuse me. When we made promises to our prince in the beer hall. Remember what the wanderer says about boasting. Never make a boast until you're sure which way the heart will turn. That is, until you know exactly what you're going to do when you are in a situation that calls for the boast to be fulfilled. He gave us these rings. They're wearing arm rings. Sign of Germanic status and wealth. The more it kills you have in battle and stuff, the more rings you have. Here, however, they're not wearing rings because of kills in battle. How do we know? Okay, Beowulf gave them to them. How else do we know? How many battles have they had since Beowulf's been king? Zip. 50 years of total peace. Okay. He says, he gave us these rings. We vowed that we would pay him back for this battle gear, these helmets and hard swords, if such a need as this ever befell him. For this he chose us from the army. He thought us worthy of glory. He gave me these treasures. He considered us good spear warriors, proud helmet wearers, even though he intended to perform this act of courage all alone. Now the day has come he says, that our noble lord has need of the support of good warriors. Let's help him. In other words, in all of Beowulf's life up until then, he's never needed any help. And the one time he does, his hand-picked warriors, the cream of the crop, his house guards, his secret service, does what? They turn tail and run. God knows for my part, 2650, that I would much prefer that the flame should enfold my body alongside my gold-giving Lord. It seems wrong to me that we should bear shields back to our land unless we first might finish off this foe, defend the life of the Prince of the Waiters. 
So he runs and jumps into the battle. He goes up to Beowulf. Okay. Notice the dragon sitting there going, you know, spewing fire. And Weehoff gives a speech. Okay. Anglo-Saxons apparently loved speeches. And he says, Beowulf, do all well as in your youth you said you would, that you would never let in your whole life your fame decline. Now, firm indeed, single-minded nobleman, with all your strength, you must protect your life. Okay, all that is just to say what? Say it again. You got to fight. What's he doing? What's Wheeloff doing here? <laughs> That's pretty much it. Come on, Beowulf. You're Beowulf. What's going to happen to your name if you don't fight against the dragon? I mean, everybody's going to end up at Beowulf chicken out at the end. <laughs> He's going in like a good coach when you're down at the halftime, and he's giving Beowulf the big pep talk. Suck it up, Beowulf. You can kill him. Come on, take on the little worm. Okay? And after these words, the worm came angrily, seeking out his enemies. The hot flames rolled in waves. Wheelof's nice little shield, poof, you know, gone, because it's just wood. So Wheelof hides behind Beowulf's shield. And then 2677, still the battle king remembered his glory. It's kind of like, what's going on? I'm Beowulf. What am I doing? And with his mighty strength, he swung his war blade with savage force so that it stuck in the skull. Again, what's he aiming for? The head. He's thinking, I take the head off this sucker. It's, we're done. Nothing else. All right? Niling shattered. Niling means son of nails. That's a pretty good name for a sword. Son of nails. Okay? First year I was teaching here, I was teaching Beowulf to a sophomore lit course on fantasy literature. And I was reading um, Madeline Lingle's which one? Wrinkle in Time. I'm pretty sure it's that one. At the same time, and I was reading some criticism on, on I think it was Madeline Lingle, and I came across something that, that said, and I've never been able to find this article since then, came across an article that said in medieval literature, when someone gets a sting or a bite to the neck, it's indicative that they suffer from the sin of pride. And you have the, the um, character in the Madden Lingle book, the guy with the big horn. And what does he do? He gets people in the neck, okay, in there. And it's for people who, I don't remember um, the book well enough. Beowulf goes after the head. And what happens? He gets bit in the neck. Okay. Is it the sin of pride? What does Hrothgar warn him about entirely in the homily? Beware the sin of pride. Okay? But we're told it was not granted to him that iron-edged weapons might ever help him in battle. His hand was too strong. The blade shatters. So the dragon comes again, and the dragon seizes him by the neck. Then I have heard in his king's hour of need, the earl beside him showed his bravery. And what does Wheelof do? He kind of thinks, I'm not going after the head. Big fangs, big mouth. He stabs the dragon a little lower down. And that does what to the dragon? That enables Beowulf to then kill the dragon. Okay, what else does it do? It's like he puts out the pilot light. And no other way I can put it. He hits the dragon where his fire-making mechanism is. Because then the dragon goes, and it's just, you know, bad breath. <laughs> Beowulf then draws the war dagger, 2703, and he carved through the worm's midsection. Now, the way I read that and a few others is he cuts the sucker in half. He does all the way around. Okay? Now, how big is the dragon? 50 paces. Not 50 feet. Paces. If a pace is about three feet, this dragon is 150 feet long. It's a big 
dragon, right? So its circumference is probably also pretty big. And we're told, they felled their foe, their force took his life. They both together had brought him down. The two noble kinsmen, a thane at need, as a man should be. Talking about Wheelof. But then the bite works on Beowulf. And it burns and swells. He realizes there's poison in him. And he sat on a seat by the wall. And on that work of giants he gazed, how stone arches and sturdy pillars held up the inside of that ancient earth hall. And with his hands, Wheelof, the thane, bathed with water his beloved lord. Okay, this is the first time Wheelof is going to wash Beowulf's face with water three times. Why three? Why not five? Why not two? Why not one? Okay. And Beowulf speaks. He knew clearly that his allotted life had cut out, had run out, his joys in the earth. All gone was his portion of days, death immeasurably near. Let's take a break and come back at around 10 after.